You're listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. To learn about graduate student fellowship opportunities with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. Today is February 26, 2020. I'm Pete Betke at the Mercatus Center, uh, the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. And today I'm with Karen Vaughn, uh, Professor Emeriti uh, from George Mason University. Um, Karen uh, is one of the leading figures in the modern history of Austrian economics, and I'm really thrilled to be able to have this conversation with her today. So I wanted to start first, uh, thanks for coming on the show. Well, thanks for having me, Pete. I'm excited to be here. And uh, I wanted to start by talking about uh, the, let's begin with the beginning. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's a sort of cliche, but uh, if you could explain how you got interested in economics and your uh, sort of beginnings in these kind of world of ideas. Now you're making me go back a number of years, but it <coughs> all started when I was an undergraduate and had no clue about anything having to do with economics or politics. I was an English major, but I read Ayn Rand. <laughs> and so like so many people, it sort of turned me on to ideas about liberty and freedom, but I still didn't know any economics. And I ran into... Larry Moss at, at uh, Queens College, who started a, a club called Students for a Free Society, which was supposed to be a counterweight to SDS. But of course, there were like eight of us, so <laughs> you know. Yeah. And he turned me on to Austrian economics. But I still, you know, I didn't know any economics. So I went and took a micro course, and I loved it. I aced it, you know, and I thought, hey, this is what I need to do. So, so Larry brought me to meet. Rothbard, and again, I was mostly interested in the politics at that time. I didn't, I didn't see any real difference between some of the st Austrian stuff they talked about and micro theory. I thought, oh gosh, this is all just great economics, and so I I had an affection for some of the Austrians, but no real understanding. Then I went to graduate school, and nobody talked about Austrians there, and they and so. Then I started to go um, just to learn conventional economics. Yeah. Can I, I actually, it's kind of, I think, an interesting observation uh, that you made about microeconomics because, um, especially maybe uh, at that time, you were still learning price theory mm -hmm. and people talked about the role of prices in society. And then you read the Austrians and they're talking about the role of prices in society. And so, and there's an order or the invisible hand, and that's all part of it. And, or was, or did your micro course stress the, mar like, the market failure stuff and all of that? Or I hardly even heard the word market failure yeah. until I got to graduate school. To me, micro explained how great the market was, right. you know, yeah. and I was just excited about that. Yeah, I think that that's a, a very interesting thing. This is you and I as historians of economics. I think we can learn a lot um, by studying what the textbooks were at a time and what yeah. they emphasize and what they de-emphasize. And I think, you know, uh, there was a, there has been a time where the main um, – knowledge that's communicated in principles of micro is why the market fails because <laughs> of monopoly externalities well, these kind of things yeah and there is kind of an interesting thing when i was in graduate school my micro course which i had charles charlie ferguson who was a real i mean he was he was basically a conservative you know mm -hmm. but when we were learning we went from the partial equilibrium to general equilibrium and he showed you know the general equilibrium system and he announced in class, it was, he was sad to have to say this, but a socialist economy could run, uh, you know, could, could be as, as efficient as a market economy because all you had to do was equate everything at these margins. And I didn't believe it, but I had no idea why I didn't believe it. I just kept yeah. thinking intuitively this doesn't make sense. But I was looking at the math, you right. know, I'm looking at, the, at all the graphs, and I said, yeah, well, I guess there are other arguments. Yeah. So you're right. This whole notion of market failure was something that came much later. Yeah. 
and something I was always a little bit wary about. Yeah, I wanted to, um, <clears throat> I don't want to get too far ahead, but it's actually an interesting uh, uh, thing to me because when I was a undergraduate, I got interested in your work because I was exposed to your book on Locke. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had to take a year-long history of economic thought as part of the requirement mm -hmm. for going to uh, be a major at mm -hmm. the school that I went to. And so I ended up by reading your book on Locke before I came here because, you mm -hmm. know, I was interested in history of economic thought. But then um, I also... Uh, your, one of your first papers that you ever published was uh, actually an economic theory paper mm -hmm. uh, and, and actually a mathematical economic oh. theory paper. <laughs> and, and so it's kind of interesting because I want to talk to you about Duke a little bit because uh -huh. uh, when you went to Duke, uh, fascinating, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, environment. So mm -hmm. talk about a little bit about that. Okay. Well, the reason I went to Duke was for the history of economic thought. I should have mentioned that when I was an undergraduate, I took two courses in the history of thought by a very, very careful and a scholar who was working on a project on showing the Aristotelian influences of later thinkers. Oh, wow. And I took a seminar with him, and he assigned me a paper on John Locke. And I was supposed to look at John Locke's theory of value. So, you know, I spent most of the semester immersed in that kind of stuff. I, you know, I, I, pub, I presented the paper. I got an A in the course. But he's, he was the one who told me that I needed to go to Duke because Duke had Joseph Spengler, and Joseph Spengler was an, an eminent authority in the field. So, I, you know, I trundled off to Duke, and, uh, plan, and I, right from the beginning, decided to be, have, have history of thought as one of my fields couple of semesters with, with uh, Spangler, but then when it came to dissertation time, <coughs> and I had first thought I'd do something different, something in the micro, the you know, mm -hmm. but I mean, this is, a, this, this is telling tales on me, but I had to come up with, a, with a, a dissertation preliminary talk, and what I knew was Locke, so I went up <laughs> and started talking about that, but then I got interested again, and I think I was interested in Locke not only because of what I learned about his approach to economics, which was, I thought, misunderstood by a lot of historians of economic thought. They tended to place him in, t in the mercantilist category, and he didn't belong there at all. But also because it was linked up with his theories of liberty and, and property. Mm -hmm. So I, that was a, a major uh, a major draw for me. Now, the funny thing is, Spengler, every time I walk into his office for a, a, some sort of dissertation conference, he'd say, so how's your work on Hume going? <laughs> and I have to say, no, 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 I'm not doing Hume, I'm doing Locke. Oh, yes. And then he would rattle off like 35 different references I should look at. Yeah. Um, you did archival work uh, for Locke as well. Can you talk about that experience? Did you, oh. have, did you, have, did you ever do... I mean, you, when you said you were an undergraduate, you spent a semester diving into the literature or whatever, but you were working now with primary documents and stuff, so. Yeah, I, I got a grant to go to England, uh, to Oxford, to work at the Bodleian Library, because they had a whole sheaf of unpublished papers there, and it was found in the attic of the descendants of, a, of uh, the Earl of Lovelace, and they were Locke's diaries, his notes on things, and so I spent every every day for two weeks in the Bodleian taking notes, and I realized I was running out of time. In those days, of course, there were no Xerox machines, mm -hmm. so they had they microfished everything, and I took it so I could take it back to work on oh. it. I mean, he had everything in there, not only notes on interest and money, but recipe for pancakes. <laughs> I mean, it was you know it was his diary. So yeah, but, yeah. Uh, did you find that, how did you find that experience? Well, it was absorbing, but, um, and I think I like the fact that I was looking into somebody's daily life and getting a view of what he was like. He was kind of cheap, was yeah. one of the things <laughs> I discovered. But um, it was a little lonely because I was by myself doing all this work and I had no one, nobody else to yeah. interact with. But I, I was glad I did it because it gave me some new things to say in my dissertation. Yeah. Yeah. And it also helped me 
I think it, it, it helps greatly on interpretation not to see what somebody writes just for publication, but for what they talk about and write on their own, or when they make notes to themselves, their thinking process, and I like that. Yeah, that's fascinating. So um, <clears throat> what what is your, so were you still, uh, while you were doing this deep dive into Locke and whatnot, were you still reading the Austrians, or? No, no, I, the only thing I did in graduate school is, uh, well, one time in, in the history of thought class, some kind of ignorant student made disparaging comments about Mises' human action because he thought he'd look at it. And he was really kind of annoying about it. And I didn't know all that much, but I knew that was out of bounds. So I jumped up and, def <laughs> and, and, and defended Mises and both basically told him just because he didn't understand it, it's no reason to disparage somebody of that eminence. I really didn't know what I was talking about too much. And you know, frankly, I, I was a little wary of the Austrians too because I hadn't met that many. And I'm Rothbard, I liked, but I thought he was, a, you know, a little well flippant about a lot of things. So I thought, no, I'm making my career. You know, I'm going to be an economist. I'm going to be a micro theorist. I'm going to be a historian of economic thought. And for the first several years. All I did was stuff related to Locke. The first couple of papers I gave were the mm -hmm. you know, first thing I ever submitted to a journal. The only thing that changed my mind about that was starting to get invited to conferences. And, and I guess my name was remembered. I think it, maybe it was even Rothbard who remembered that I had come to his salon, you know, mm -hmm. on the Upper West Side. But I, I went to um, first a Liberty Fund conference that he was one of the speakers at. And then the next year, 1974, was South Royalton. And that was the first real conference trying to bring together young scholars who might be interested in the Austrian school. Mm -hmm. And that was a revelation to me. I met Kersner there. Lachman was there. Of course, Rothbard was there. I met a lot of the young, uh, Mario Rizzo, Jerry O'Drisco, Suda Shinoy. And, and then there were people who weren't specifically Austrians, but they were fellow travelers interested. Steve Payevich was one, for example. Oh, William Hutt was there. So, you know, and all of a sudden, I was thinking, gosh, this is really something I want to get yeah. into and, and learn more about. And I should say that f a follow-up to that, Larry Moss was editing a series of books on the Austrians, and he organized a conference at the SEA meetings in 1974 on at what is called Ludwig von Mises, a critical reassessment. And he asked me to discuss, be the sole discussant of the four papers on there. Well, having come from not knowing anything to being the discussant of papers by Kersner and Rothbard and Moss and then this other guy, Bill Baumgarten, I've kind of lost contact mm -hmm. with, I had to read everything that summer. I mean, I read all the papers. I read all of the references you know, in the footnotes. Because I really thought I needed to, you know, I can't, yeah. couldn't get up there and make a fool of myself. And the one paper that really grabbed my attention was Murray's paper on socialist calculation. And in that one, you know, he was extolling Mises. Well, remembering what my micro professor said about, well, socialism says can be as every bit as efficient. I was fascinated by this. And this was the one thing that I, um, paid special attention to. And through that, there was a reference to Hayek, who I basically had never heard of. Oh, wow. That's it, yeah. You know. I was going to ask you about Hayek coming into the picture. Yeah. Well, in those early days of the, of the Austrian um, revival, Hayek was not a major figure. And yeah. I think it was partly because Rothbard thought he was a turncoat, you know. Right. Yeah. But um, I read, I started then reading the Hayek papers on, on, uh, on calculation. And I thought, no, he's really great. You know, he's got so many insights. So that, you know, that was really the turning point for me. One other person, that, uh, th th so Jim Buchanan hasn't come into your ah, universe yet. Ah, good question. Because it, Murray also had a reference to Buchanan's LSE essays on cost in there. Okay. And <coughs> I didn't, I sort of heard of Buchanan. He actually, Buchanan was in the audience in that SEA meeting. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, the place was packed. It was yeah. really interesting. 
But um, so I read the LSC essays on cost. I got a hold of it, and then I got saw the reference to cost and choice. So that year, I read yeah. cost and choice. Okay. So like my whole future opened up before yeah. me in that in that year. It's all due to some footnotes. <laughs> it's all due to some footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> never, it never pays to ignore the footnotes. No, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, uh, let me ask you a little bit about the the socialist calculation debate because that issue is so on the minds of people even today. It's uh, This is the 100th anniversary of Mises' article being published <coughs> and further elaborations by Hayek. So uh, you published a very important paper in Economic Inquiry on this uh, reassessment of the debate. Mm -hmm. um, explain a little bit about the context of, you know, just like you said about your professor, micro professor saying that. Uh, explain where people thought the debate was at the time in the late 70s, and then how you changed the sort of terms of that debate, or challenged it <coughs> at least, yeah. yeah. Challenge is probably a better yeah. word. The real, as far as I could tell, it, it, was a, it was a settled issue. Nobody paid any attention to it anymore because the mathematics showed socialism, you know, uh, could, could be as efficient, and after, uh, uh, Learning came out with the um, trial and error solution. Everybody said, "Oh yeah, this will be just fine." And there was there were no references, uh, uh, recent references to it in the literature. I started that paper when um, we moved to the Washington area, and I knew I was going to be looking for a job pretty soon, and I didn't want to do John Locke again. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I had just had my daughter, so I wasn't working at the time. So I decided I was going to write a paper on this. And I had no university connection, so once a week I paid a babysitter, and I'd go down to the Library of Congress and get every piece of, of literature I could find, you know, and so I could wow. read the whole history of it. Then I'd come home and dutifully write my paper. And when I s sent it off, I sent it off to, um, yeah, sent, that's right, I sent it right off to Economic Inquiry. And Leon Hooped was one of the readers, and he he said something to me later on, oh, you know, so, Mies, so Mises was right after all, you know. So um, as I got it published, and it was kind of a talking point for me, for, you know, for a long time, what was surprising to me <laughs> is, Within a couple of years, other people were writing papers on the same subject. Now, I'm I'm not I'm not claiming credit for that. Maybe it was in the air, but um, I guess Morell had a paper, and then uh, I can't remember the, some of the other authors. But it there was a, a re a reinvestigation started after that, and I think oh the other thing I should mention, and that was in. In cost and choice, Buchanan had also suggested that the Austrians were probably right about yeah. some of those issues. So, I think you know it was just a change in zeitgeist, mm -hmm. you know, in the profession. But yeah, mine was the first. I was very pleased to be able to say that. How? So, um, let me just back up a little bit because you mentioned something I think that's, that's uh, very interesting, which is about Hayek mm -hmm. and the Austrians. My um, it's funny that you said that about Rothbard because my undergraduate teacher is a man named Hans Senholz, mm -hmm. and he also discounted Hayek tremendously, mm -hmm. and he always compared Hayek to the – he referred to Hayek as the John Stuart Mill of the <laughs> Austrians. So in his mind, John Stuart Mill was the great turncoat on the Smithian project, uh -huh. and then – but Hayek was a great turncoat on the Misesian, you uh -huh. know, Menger, Mises, Bambavrik, uh -huh. you know, kind of project. And so, uh, but Hayek, right after that South Royalton conference, that fall, won the Nobel Prize. Uh -uh. And, and you talked about being very excited after the South Royalton conference. What must have been that like for a young economist that now sees this research program kind of being affirmed at the highest levels of the profession? Or is, uh, is, how did you view it? Well, for, for me, since I had, not, had never considered myself an Austrian, and I was, and I never, I actually, I always hated calling myself an Austrian. It seems to me, I didn't want a label, mm -hmm. you know, and especially in those days, I didn't want a label. All I could say is, I'm very interested in the Austrian research program, you know. But for me, when Hayek wins the prize, I'm thinking, wow, this 
reaffirms everything I started to think about just from hearing the arguments and reading ab and reading about it. And it and that turned me on to reading even more of Hayek. And I thought, if Buchanan thinks the Austrians have something going for them, Hayek wins the Nobel Prize. You know, uh, Axel Leyenhoff was 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 yeah. um, receptive. Then, yeah, it it isn't kooky. It's legitimate. And you know, and, it's and not just in Murray's living room. Yeah, not just in <laughs> Murray's living room. And it it really started me rethinking because here I had this disconnect. I love conventional mm -hmm. neoclassical micro theory. But all this other stuff, people were talking about uncertainty and t and time and and processes and all. How do I put it together? And frankly, that's for, for most of my career. That's what I was trying to do: figure out, you know, what parts fit and what parts don't mm -hmm. fit. Yeah, you can you. Um, um, so you also wrote a paper on does it matter if costs are subjective, uh -huh. which is is. Um, I want to come back to Buchanan in a second, but that piece also is a very uh, challenging piece to the idea of basic cost-benefit analysis. We do so maybe talk about that a little bit. And yeah, that that grew out of a conversation I had at, with somebody. Can't quite remember who it was right now, but w I was talking about how great this you know this book was, Cost and Choice, and this this whole how deeply he. Um, Buchanan investigated the nature of cost, and and if it's subjective, it you know it, it, it is, um, it has all these implications. And the person looked at me and said, "Yeah, but so what? You know, exactly what Baumol said in his article. Yeah. You know, so what? I mean, you still can do economics because you know price, when mar when all the marginal conditions obtain, you know that's that's cost. And I'm thinking." Well, you know, that needs to be addressed. That, so what? And so that's what I, I went back and I started. And I was really writing that paper for myself, to, you know, to try to figure it out. And, and um, I won't rehearse all of the arguments, but the, the, the payoff in that paper was as long, yeah, if all equilibrium conditions are met, yeah, I guess you can say that, you know, prices come close to measuring people's subjective evaluations, because if they don't, the markets will readjust. But in public policy, public poli and regulatory policy is all aimed at non-equilibrium conditions. So it seemed to me that you couldn't use market prices as perfect proxies for, for costs. I mean, that's where I was at that time. And then, but it also started me thinking on the whole nature, nature of a non-equilibrium world. And I know that's something that eventually becomes very important to the Austrians, but at that time, people weren't talking quite like that anymore yeah. at, at yet. You know, yeah. they were, so th I started thinking about, well, well what's life, life outside of equilibrium? And you know, if, if, yeah, maybe markets adjust, but in between the, the disequilibrium position to the equilibrium position, what's going on there? Yeah. So it started. Um, I don't know if you listen to the the uh, shows that they have here that Tyler the conversations with Tyler ever, but one of the questions he always asks is about people's uh, own personal production function, <laughs> and uh, I think this is kind of a silly question at some level, but actually I was turned on to it just by something that you just said, which I always found tremendously intellectually attractive uh, t about you uh, as a teacher and as a scholar which is that I think you exhibit a, uh, like a fundamental curiosity and that your work exhibits the idea that you are unleashing this curiosity to figure out just stuff for yourself in a lot of ways. And you're not really worried about playing professional games as much as figuring it out for yourself. And I think that's very attractive to anyone that wants to understand about ideas and the, and the, and the value of them. And I just want to, you know, if, if, if I'm, I'm asking this self-reflect on something that's maybe <laughs> like it just, you just mm -hmm. do it rather than reflect on it. But you said something about the Southern paper, which is that you're just trying to write it for yourself to figure out these issues. Mm -hmm. How would you describe that with everything, like m your main thrust of your work, even in the Austrian economics in America and other kind of things like that, that that's like the main input into the production function of Karen Vaughan? Well, I never quite thought of it that way, but I think that's exactly right. 
I never knew how to write a paper just because I knew it would get published, you know. Everything I ever picked up was uh, some question that I wanted to figure out for myself. That's, I mean, my Vita compared to like some top people, it's kind of sparse, you know. But every one of my papers, it's because every one of my papers took a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, I was really trying to figure out what was going on. Well, and, and mm -hmm. once I got onto Hayek, it, a lot of it was trying to get into his mind. And then how does that make sense to me? So I'm actually, I'm very flattered that you picked that up because I didn't think of it that way. But that's, you know, uh, especially those first two papers, I was, you know, it wasn't just this is what they said, but does it really make sense? Yeah. And then if that makes sense, then what's the next thing that, that we have to worry about? Yeah. I mean, that's how my whole preoccupation over my career from then on was like, wh what, what's the point of equilibrium conditions? Yeah, that's, that's And it, it all emerged from me trying to figure out, well, what happens out there, you know, in the real world? If we can't use this model, what else can we use? Yeah, I want to... Um, come back in a few minutes to the Austrian economics in America and some of your later writings. But before that, I want to, um, when you got interested in Austrian economics, one of the, uh, you know, after the South Royalton thing, one of the controversies that embroiled the school for the next decade is the equilibrium debates between mm -hmm. Kirzner and, and, mm -hmm. and Lachman. But at the same time, it's soon after that that you also mm -hmm. become uh you know, interested in learning a lot and interacting a lot with Buchanan uh, mm -hmm. down at VPI and everything. You mentioned Liberty Fund conferences. It's, it, it, it's my impression, at least, that your relationship with Buchanan uh, started with those kind of conferences as well. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? And, mm -hmm. and maybe you could talk a little bit about Kersner, Lachman, and Buchanan and that, it, well, just in how that, um, that period of time between, say, the the uh, the South Royalton and then the early 80s uh, mm -hmm. kind of idea. Well, you're right. The Liberty Fund conferences were crucial. Actually, I one time wrote that if it hadn't been for Liberty Fund, I might not have had a career. I mean, partly it was because I started going to them in the time when I had no colleagues. I mean, no yeah. colleagues who were interesting. I was teaching at the University of Tennessee, and it was a sleepy place, shall we say, and the people who were writing were not doing anything I was interested in. So when I started getting invited to the Liberty Fund conferences... Can I interrupt you for one second? I don't know. When I had Jim Buchanan as a teacher, he talked about when he got his master's degree from the University of Tennessee, yeah. and one of the comments he said is he said, you learned a lot about whiskey and baseball, but very little about <laughs> economics. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, I, I, won't, I won't go into it, though. <laughs> but... Um, and the uh, and it wasn't just they had Liberty Fund hadn't quite figured out how they were going to do things yet, so they would have a series of one day conferences. Like mm -hmm. and I went to one in Washington because I lived here. Then they had these gargantuan long ones, and the first one I went to at Virginia Tech was two weeks long. Oh wow! And it was Buchanan and Tulloch shared one of the speaking positions. Bob Nozick was a speaker, and I think the third one was Charlie Plot. And the idea was they were going to try to re, uh, um, reinvigorate the old Volcker Fund conferences where a scholar would come with a book project and talk about it. So, and, and there must have been 20, oh, 20 people in attendance, and they were big conferences. But, um, and that had very little to do with Austrian economics. It was, you know, Nozick talked about anarchy, state, and utopia. Buchanan and Tulloch talked about public choice. But the, the real thing that mattered to me was the openness of the discussion. Here there were colleagues. I mean, not that I knew any of them, but nobody was privileged. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's voice counted. Sort of what I thought academics was going to be like, you know, when I started. And uh, I got to know Buchanan pretty well. Um, you got to know everybody pretty well. You know, you ate with them, you yeah. know, you went places. And so There's not much to do down in. <laughs> no, 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 nothing to do in Blacksburg. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then uh, we, um, I got invited back the next year, and the next year, and the next year, until Liberty Fund told him he couldn't invite me anymore. So, <laughs> you know, but and uh, well, we'll talk about the move later. Yeah. But uh, my, 
I'm losing the thread. What was your fish? Well, thing? I was just asking about how you develop this, you know, these intellectual interests oh. in these streams because you're, no. you know, the the, you, as you said earlier, you know, it's all after this South Royalton thing. This I sort know. of world opens up for you, and I was just yeah. trying to get a. Well, I went. Of course, I went to the series of Austrian conferences, and but that. I guess this is the this is the interesting thing. It was there were two different things going on, in, or it's two different kinds of thinking going on in my life, and one was getting immersed in the Austrian stuff, but the other one was Buchanan's conferences opened up public choice, and it opened up connections to philosophy. He always had a philosopher there, and and of course the philosophy of liberalism, and he would have somebody who had. Well, like Charlie Plott, who was doing experimental stuff, or someone who was working on information theory, or so, mm -hmm. you know something that, in the more conventional profession, was working on themes that fed in in many respects to the Austrian literature. So, sort of getting it from both sides. Yeah, yeah. that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, so, um, did at the time. So, like you said, before Hayek won the the Nobel Prize, or before you know, before you read this piece, mm -hmm. Hayek wasn't that like talked about in classes mm -hmm. or you know whatever. H what was Buchanan's stature like? Because he also wins the Nobel Prize, but at this time, so he's big, but is he big or? Well, this is a time in my life where I would not have been able to evaluate his st stature generally. I knew he had been president of the Southern Economic Association. That can conveys a certain amount of status. When I was an, a graduate student at Duke, he was invited in to give a talk. And I had no idea who he was, but everybody was, oh, Buchanan's coming to give yeah. a talk. So, I mean, he had, he had a, a very s established reputation. I think um, probably if you were to ask somebody up in the Northeast, uh, maybe not quite so much, but, you know, in the South, certainly. Yeah. And I, th I think his well, as I said, at that at that time, I I I knew he published a lot. All I but I, I was so focused on what interested me. I didn't really think much about that. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew he was generally known, mm -hmm. and so I can't. Other than that, I can't tell you. The the one last remark on that. I, I wanted to see if you can, he you said that no at the seminars everyone was an equal and. Mm -hmm. There was no one was privileged over mm -hmm. other ones. How did that interaction relate to like maybe your earlier interactions with the uh, with respect to Rand or Rothbard or <laughs> you know, um, and then now this this other thing where you have Buchanan or whatever. Well, I mean, I had my differences with Rothbard, but I have to say, he was extremely wel welcoming and open to anybody who showed up and showed an interest in libertarian ideas. And he would, he would listen. Of course, you know, you tended to privilege his discussion because mm -hmm. you figured you were learning from him. But he was very congenial. So I, and he, he I never felt like a student there, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that was true of everybody. You know, you'd show up at his apartment. You never know who was going to be there and what the discussion would be, you know. And so, Walt, I met Walter Block there the first time, and he was getting a degree at Chicago, I guess it was, and you know, so we'd talk about that. So I, f I felt a, a very congenial atmosphere there. Um, it was probably, who was the other one you asked me about? Well, yeah. Rand. Oh, Rand. Oh, yeah. So I only went to one objectivist lecture, and I would never go back. <laughs> I never saw a, a bigger group of people who were so pleased with themselves and so imperious and dismissive of anything that didn't fit within the, with, within the, the uh, well, it wasn't just the ideology. You had to use the right words, too, <laughs> you know. So, I mean, I was totally turned off by that. You know, I started off by reading Rand, but by, by the time I got out of graduate school, I just, yeah, you no. know, had, even though there were some of the ideas I still thought were good, I, th I thought the whole cult was just absurd. Yeah, it's a, um, and and you mentioned the difference between the way that Buchanan uh, and the Liberty Fund conferences were organized and the way that academic life had originally shown up for you. And yeah. I just you know that that I think is an important aspect of the 
the culture of of this sort of uh, community of learners, right? So yeah, and really, when you, I think the Hayek program is different, and I think you've you've recreated a lot of the whole ethos of the Liberty Fund Conference here. But when I first w was um, when I began my career, I realized it was a game, you know, and not so much at Tennessee because nobody was really paying any attention to that, but in certain areas, even in the economics department, all right, how many how many entries can you get on your Vita and um, one upping other people and sort of there was some of the some of the members of the department would be very dismissive, and you never felt that same sense of collegiality in the department or even in the university as a whole as you felt the competitive structure. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things Liberty Fund was so valuable about. You were not competitive with anybody because you probably didn't know most of them and they were in different fields and nobody felt they had to score off anybody else. It was just a really general discu collegial discussion about ideas that you could disagree over and still be respectful. And, uh, you, well, you've been around enough economists to know that you know, that doesn't always happen. <laughs> when yeah. They yeah, I do think, I, I think, yeah, I mean, there's a, this, this issue of curiosity and the pleasure in finding things out is actually um, something that you see in a lot of um, good, good people in academia, but it's not always like the obvious thing, and it's, you come to the belief that it is. Um, so I wanted to ask you about, uh, so in the, we're going to talk about this later, but you go into academic administration and, and whatnot, um, and you emerge out of that, and then you work on this project of Austrian economics in America. And uh, this becomes sort of the definitive book describing this whole period that you, in fact, had just experienced yourself. <coughs> talk a little bit about that project and the inputs into it and the impetus behind it? Okay, well, I had been department chair until 89, and from, eight was it 83 to 89, 82 to 89, I had a hard time managing both the, the administrative aspects, the converging of the, you know, the centers, and still trying to keep an active um, research career. I, I'm not one of these people who can work, you know, from six in the morning to midnight, mm -hmm. and I, you know, and so I managed to get some things written, and but it seemed to me that a lot of the Austrian discussion and all was unfocused, and and I uh, and I felt like I needed to get back into it. Well, I got invited to give a paper at Duke on Menger, and I thought. And oh, I had I had written the Palgrave on entry in, on Menger, and I thought, well, yeah, I can do that, you know. And then I said, but what can I say about Menger that's new? And I thought, I know. Menger to me, Menger really was the the driving force of the Austrian revival. It was because I saw Mengerian economics as different from the way it was portrayed in a lot of the history of thought literature. So I wrote this paper called "The Mengerian Roots of the Austrian Revival." Mm -hmm. Well, I got back from the conference. I looked at it. I said, this is an outline for a book. <laughs> and, and I can get my piece said, and I can, yeah. I can tell the story the way I see it. And um, I also thought I could, I could put the, the work going on at GMU in a, in a positive light that would show people how valuable it's, you know, it's been. And so I started, you know, and I took the, the original paper and I broke it up and then I added some chapters and I just sat down and wrote it for about a year and a half, I guess it was. And as I was writing it, getting back to this, I'm figuring things out for myself once again. And you know, we had whole, you, you alluded to the kersner lachman equilibrium thing. Well, I'm still trying, still was trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think I, I made, an effort to present both sides as dispassionately as possible. And then I got, and I uh, got to the last chapter, where do we go from here? Well, I got stumped because I'm thinking, I think Lachman's basically right. You know, I thought Lachman, 
uh, where do you go from Lachman? You know, I always thought Kersner was clinging way too much to um, neoclassical forms. And from his perspective, it was a smart move when he was writing about entrepreneurship. But we needed to move on from there. And I kept thinking, you know, but how do you do it? Because Lachman, you've read Lachman, mm -hmm. it's, it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing systematic about it. So I thought, well, I could spend another year trying to write another couple of mm -hmm. chapters, or just this is the story I'm telling about the revival, and then move on to you know to mm -hmm. try to figure things out after that. So, and I was very pleased. Cambridge accepted that. Yeah. You know, and yeah I should have mentioned earlier your book with Locke is a Chicago University Press book, and your book with with uh, um, you know the Austrian Economics in America is with Cambridge and. So you were very successful. I mean, a lot of times when people think back on the the Austrian revival, they tend to, and the people that are involved, you know, they they tend to recognize that for a period of time, you know, it, books were being published by a Catholic devotional press <laughs> yeah. in Kansas City, right? And um, and yet you were able to to meet those standards of that, and 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 before most everyone else. Um, of the of the, your well, generation. Can I just an, yeah. A lot of it had to do with my relationship with with HES. I mean, the block book my was my link to Duke, mm -hmm. and um, well, no, actually not so much that I could get in. I could get into that, but the uh, Austrian book, I think, was uh, Crawford Goodwin was the editor of the series, and not only did I know him from Duke, but he was. Um, he and I were colleagues in the History of Economic Society. So I had a reputation as, as, a, as an honest scholar right. in the History of Economic Society. Um, before I ask you about the end of the, the, the sort of, uh, you know, the, this last part about where we go from here, I wanted to go back and ask you about two uh, kind of um, unpublished projects, I think. Uh, one of them is, is I think that in, a, am I right that in the, in the at one period of time, right after the South Royalton area or whatever, you and Larry were asked to maybe do a big JEL paper or uh -huh. whatever on the Austrians and yeah. what it's all about or something. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? <laughs> one of my failed projects. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we learn yeah. a lot from we learn more from wastebaskets than but we yeah. learn from. What yeah. what I learned was I am not a very good co co-author, <laughs> <laughs> and neither was Larry. Yeah. <laughs> Because even though we talked a lot and we had, you know, it's very similar ideas, we, I thought what we needed to do was to s do essentially what I did in, in the, and later on in the book, which was look at the literature of the revival and, and you know, define who was in this. I mean, and Larry thought any piece of paper that had anything that sounded like an Austrian idea, no matter who wrote it. This is an exaggeration, by the way, but still. Should be in there. Yeah, <laughs> you should be in there. So he would come up with lists of hundreds of, of references, and I would say, but that's not getting to the heart of what we want to do, which is talk about the Austrian revival, you know. And so, and I would write up something and send it to him. And he would throw it away, and he'd write up something and send it to me. And I would look at it and say, this is crazy, way too much. And we, So finally, we just had to agree we couldn't, <laughs> we okay. couldn't do it. So fi the consolation prize to that is we wrote, uh, we wrote the paper on the Ricardo effect. Yeah. Uh -huh. That was another one, pulling teeth, rewriting constantly. It's a very good paper, though. You, you did, that's what I was going to, I mean, I, we didn't get a chance to do this, but, you know, when you were doing these uh, explorations into Austrian economics, it's not just the calculation debate, it's not just, you know, the subjectivity of cost, but you also wrote about business cycles and other kinds of things, price theoretic foundations. So, okay. I mean, you made across all of them, you know, so <laughs> from micro to comparative economics, uh -huh. pretty, very impressive body of work. Um, the, um, uh, the other paper <laughs> was uh, I'm, uh, um, was your uh, efforts in in, ex in examining public choice, mm -hmm. uh, both uh, some of which in the constitutional political economy angles, but also the role of uh, sort of the, the behavioral foundations of public choice, mm -hmm. and that comes out of these I imagine these Buchanan mm -hmm. uh, uh, stuff. Yeah. Well, it also came out of going to a lot of the the um, the seminars over the Public Choice Center and listening to the way people reasoned and argued about things. And one of the things that kind of annoyed me is, I mean, it was, I shouldn't say that. One of the things that was obvious about their, their method 
was when you're looking at any public policy proposal or something, you ask, who gains? You know, that's what economists do. You know, uh, who, who's going to benefit most from it? But they translated that into always saying that it had to be a monetary gain. Who, who's, you know, whose job was going to be more secure and who was going to get the bigger, the, the, um, yeah. the bigger budgets. And that, and that would be true in, in any kind of debate, like, t like teachers, uh, if they were arguing for, for more funds for education, it had to be only because they wanted more, you know, they wanted higher salaries. And, and I'm thinking, yeah, there's a strong, out, you know, I don't want to discount that. But you can't also ignore that a lot of people really believe in ideologies without thinking about the cost. And that when when a, a policy proposal comes up, it it could yes, they're going to be gainers, but the way people will justify it to themselves and maybe really genuinely believe it is because they think it's going to affect the yeah. public good. So that was one of the things I was looking at in that paper. I think that it was called the limits of Homo economicus yeah. and public policy, and. Um, it was a difficult paper to write because it, I had to delve more deeply into the constitutional economics literature and public choice literature. So again, it's me trying to figure this out and make a point. And I gave that paper a couple of times, but I never published it. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure wh now why I know. Never. I think I sent it off to one place, and they rejected it, and yeah. I didn't we'll like it. We'll have to remedy that. Yeah. The, uh, the reason why I, I'm harping on that is because I think that this play between ideas and interests yeah. are, um, is such an important thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it's crucial. And um, that's I think, is the reason why so many free market economists have kind of lost the public debate because you can't only accuse people of wanting to be you know financially richer people have ha have interests but they also have ideologies they have they have um uh well as adam smith said you've got self-interest and you've got fellow feeling yeah. and both play a role and if you only appeal to the self-interest and you leave out the fellow feeling you're missing half the argument, and you're making a bad argument for the market. Yeah. No, I think that that's yeah. a very, um, a very important point to stress because um, it uh, the cynicism that some people, um, you know, attribute to um, public choice kind of criticisms can have uh, this effect. Um, in your mind, was Buchanan more? receptive to what you were doing with that than the other practitioners of public choice? <clears throat> I, I don't think so. <laughs> Let's see, when did I write that paper? That would have been, that would have been after, that would have been the early 90s. He was, by this time, you know, he had won the Nobel Prize right. and he was off doing his, um, uh, Junkets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, not just the junkets. He, he had gotten that, you know, the work ethic stuff right. and all. And, and by that time, I wasn't talking to him all that much okay. about it right. because I really couldn't get on board with the work ethic stuff. Yeah. I was just wondering because, you know, later on in the 2000s, he starts to then go back to saying yeah. that we better deal with the soul of classical liberalism yeah, and right. things, which you're, is what you're anticipating earlier on. Uh, um, so, um, so maybe you had an influence on them. <laughs> yeah, maybe I know. did. Who knows? Um, all right. I wanted to uh, – so you end the book, Austrian Economics in America, with where we're going to go. Mm -hmm. um, so first, I guess, from where you thought we were going to go to what you've witnessed where we've gone, how would you maybe rewrite the last chapter of that again? Or do you see that we're still just – Well, the, I think the question that – inspired me and is still puzzling me is one that the Austrians don't talk about much anymore. And that is, how do we, what is the metaphor, the way in which we conceive and explain the whole market process? I, you know, and you're putting me on the spot because I haven't read a lot of the most recent stuff. But it seems like you're working in parts, important parts too. Um, but I still 
think we need an alternative paradigm to to put these parts into. And that was brings me back to the couple of papers that I wrote in the early 90s, and, and no, late 90s, late 90s and early 2000s. And that was, I, I went back to Hayek, and I kept thinking, here he has these verbal discussions of, of, and of knowledge and discovery procedures and all, and everybody ignores it. And why do they ignore it? Well, because it seems to like just a lot of words. But I started to think, if we were to take these words seriously and we tried to think of how you'd explain a market process, what is he's, you know, what, what is uh, consistent? And for a while, I was working on this project calling her, uh, Hayek, well, my, the paper was called Hayek Simplicity Economics, mm -hmm. but that was going to be the focus of a book that I never wrote. But uh, <coughs> what was the implicit economics behind all of these, these, these descriptions and things he said? And it occurred, and that's when I started, he, he Hayek, um, used a lot of evolutionary metaphors. Mm -hmm. And I'm uh, thinking, well, let's think about evolution. And what is what happens in evolution? What well, change? But what changes? What changes are, are um, organisms. And they are, organisms are really organizations of information where they communicate with, you know, within the organism. And the organisms communicate among each other. So it started me, what is the analogy in, 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 um, in the market? And that's when I started thinking seriously about institutions. Mm -hmm. I mean, I obviously read Lachlan on institutions as points of reference or something like that. But I was thinking, well, all right, how does that function? Mm -hmm. And that's when I wrote that paper. Again, I'm trying to figure out how mm -hmm. it functions. And it seems to me that if we talk about learning, we talk about uh, you know adjustments to all of the mo little changes in the market, what we're talking about is learning of of techniques, we're learning about ways to do things. We're not just learning that products are out there. We're learning how to trade with each other. And these market institutions are the fabric that hold all these changes together. And we need to take that so much more seriously because it's when these institutions undergo upheaval that people get all upset. Mm -hmm. You know, and then what do I do? What do I do? And and I started to think all kinds of trivial examples, like when I tried to go shopping in a market. <laughs> in a little town in Austria and didn't know how because they had different customs about weighing the produce and stuff right. like that. And I realized what we are learning are just an accumulation of, of, of market techniques and, mar and, and information about how trades are made and that in a market process, change can only occur in an, in an orderly fashion because we have a bedrock of these things. Mm -hmm. I mean... If you look at this, all the recent science fiction stuff with all this apocalypse, you know, no, everything's destroyed. Nobody knows how to do anything anymore. But markets are these fabrics of and webbings of all these different interlocking institutions. And I started to think that gave us a much stronger argument against the the, the pretensions of government control of the mm -hmm. economy. They can't. When Hayek said they can't possibly know all the information. And I wondered, well, what information is he talking about? This is the information mm -hmm. he's talking about. That and all the local knowledge. What is local knowledge? It's knowledge of what's out there and how do you do this and who's the person you go to. Again, it's part of this web of, ins of the institutional background. Yeah, and then that <laughs> led me which to, think, well, to looking at uh, complex adaptive systems because I was thinking, all right, I can say this, but it's still words. Mm -hmm. And... And then I discovered, no, there's this whole, this whole science that I didn't know about that shows the adaptation of these complex systems. So. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's an amazing project. I, I remember I, I, I heard a, I'm sure you were there as well. There was a HES meetings at uh, UBC in, in British Columbia, and Axel Leyenhoffit was giving the like, lecture, you know, the mm -hmm. distinguished lecture or whatever. And he had this great line where he said that uh, in economics, there was a choice in 1949. And the choice was to go in the direction of Samuelsonian economics mm -hmm. or to go in the direction of Mises and Hayek economics. 
And what happened was the profession went in the Samsonian, and mm -hmm. we've now run the full course of mm -hmm. the Samsonian revolution. Right. He says, but the problem is, is that if you imagine a fork in the road, mm -hmm. the number of people who have tried to develop the Mises Hayek program have only been a few. Mm -hmm. And so the arrow of the of what went on with mm -hmm. Samuelsonian goes way out from mm -hmm. where it started. Mm -hmm. But the Mises Hayek arrow has only gone very little. And what you can't do is you can't go from point A down to now here. Mm -hmm. You have to go all the way back and mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And in, in some sense, like what you're talking about is actually in your Mangarian roots and everything mm -hmm. is actually tracing that out. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're at this point where you're talking about the Hayek's implicit economics, the my understanding, and, and and you can correct me uh, if I'm uh, uh, if you think I'm reading too much into it, but the way I see what you do in that piece is that Hayek had all these promising things that he said mm -hmm. post 1970, mm -hmm. and then he had all these contributions that he made between 1920 and 1950 mm -hmm. that are based in the economic language of that time, mm -hmm. but they're saying different things. And so, can I actually uh, read? Uh, the the economics that's in the stuff and the stuff that he said post 70s mainly about institutions mm -hmm. and society not mm -hmm. necessarily economics can I read the questions of his economics how would his economics have changed in that language community and then how would his institutions then maybe feed back into his earlier work mm -hmm. to change that so that we could maybe go forward with this project do you think that's a right characterization mm -hmm. of your argument or well I, I might have phrased it a little bit differently, but I, I think that's close. I'm, I, I think you're right to say that when he was writing in the 30s and 40s and, and all, in his economics, he was using the language of the profession that everybody thought was unproblematic. Right. And they thought it was unproblematic because they're still thinking in a Marshallian sense where, yeah, we know all these adjustments take place. This is... and. What he didn't, he could never have predicted the Samuelsonian fork. You know? right. But then, even in those early papers, if you see the progression, he realizes there are limitations. I mean, he keeps, you know, all right, he writes economics and knowledge, and he points out the limitations of equilibrium. And then, but then he goes to um, the use of knowledge in society, where he shows, well, you know, people can adjust to changes, you know, they're used. And that seems fits beautifully in a neoclassical context. You know, it's a nice story to mm -hmm. tell, and that's probably why it's one of his most cited articles. But then, um, when and then he starts the, the paper where he, he criticizes imperfect competition, uh, and again he's saying, "Wait a minute, you're taking this too seriously. Let's you know, let's really look at what's happening." And and I th I always and then it isn't until the '60s he writes economics as a discovery procedure. Yeah. And that I see as a clear break with that other language. Yeah. Because he finally realizes he can't say what he wants to say in that other language. But then what language does he use? Right. And he uses, uh, he uses evolutionary um, metaphors there. Yeah. Because he sees that's what an economy is. It's not an, it's not an oikonomia. It's not an economy. It, it's a cataloxy. It, you know, it, it's an order. And I think it was a shame we, we lost that, that term order because I mean that's that's what Adam Smith was talking about and that's what most of the 19th century well a lot of the 19th century was talking about so I think I, I'm fascinated by this notion of the forks in the road I, I haven't thought about that but can we go back well I think maybe we go back with the insights but we we choose not physics as our metaphor but biology of course, it's discouraging to see what a lot of the bio the um, evolutionary economists have done, you know. But right. <laughs> so, and I think it's this fascination that came with Samuelson and wanting to be a real science. You know, right. we've got to be a real science, as if a science of human beings is ever going to be in any way like a science of inanimate, inanimate right. objects. But economists wanted to be real scientists, and that was what was going on. Well, for my graduates career you know early on and I've bought into it yeah I'm a real scientist I'm not like sociologists you know but then is it the, the notion of science in the European sense is really what we are 
careful analysis and discourse about, uh, uh, you know, about about the world around us. N not and it doesn't require reducing it to mathematical models. We just need a way of, of our brains getting around it. That's kind of vague. I'm sorry, but you know. No, no, it's it's actually brilliant. It's a great <laughs> place for us to to wrap this up. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Pete. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program podcast. To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. For more information about graduate student fellowship opportunities for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. We hope you recommend students to our programs or consider applying yourself.